Let the church say amen. amen. Oh, y'all can do better than that. Anybody glad God woke you up this morning and glad God started you on your way. God glad God woke you up, gave you the activity of your limbs. You're in your right mind. You know you're going to where you're coming from. You ain't got everything that you want, but you thank God for the little bit that you do have. God is worthy of the praise from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same. The name of the Lord is worthy to be praised. And anybody in here that's a child of God, when you walk through the doors on the day, you realize that you are about to enter into his gates with what? Thanksgiving. And you are about to come into his courts with praise. Therefore, you ought to be thankful unto him and bless his name. I'll not have to get up here and say, give me a G, give me a O, give me a D. What does that spell? Well, when you woke up this morning, you ought to have woke up with Jesus on your mind. And you ought to have come into the house of God on this afternoon for the purpose. If don't nobody else want to praise him, I praise him all by myself. Glory to God. God is good and all the time. Amen. Find somebody close to you. Say, neighbor, God loves you. And I do too. And if you love me as much as I love you, then nothing can break our love in two. Amen. 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 First, give an honor to God who's the head of my life. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm just so thankful and I've been looking forward to this night here since the, the idea came forward. Um, and amen, we're just so thankful for everybody that came out tonight in support of this. Um, and not just locally, we got folk, um, one sister here drove all the way from Charleston, South Carolina. She, she, saw, she saw the ad on Facebook and she said she was coming. So guess what? She's here on the night, amen. So if she can drive five hours. I know some of her can drive four minutes, friend. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I got Fort Walton in the house back there. Amen. Praise God. Glad to have them here. Amen. Amen. And everyone, everyone in the We got a plaque in the house. We got to say amen. We're glad to have them here. Amen. Amen. And I, I must take this time for all of you all. I know I got a bunch of y'all that are watching this online right now. Facebook Live. We want to welcome you into the service. Amen. And we pray that you are blessed by the things that take place, by the words that are said. Amen. Here on tonight. And before you go to heaven, stop by the Sweetwater Church of Christ. Amen. Where the gospel is preached. Preach. Amen. You heard it from them. You ain't hear it from me. So come on out and check it out uh, for yourself. Amen. I got work. Did anybody come to hear a word from the Lord? Amen. Amen. Follow me to the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter number three, the book of Daniel, chapter number three. And we're going to read verses 16 to 17. And then we're going to go to the book of Jude, chapter number one and verse number 24. The grass withers and the flower thereof fadeth away, but the word of God shall stand forever. Amen. Daniel, chapter three, verse 16 and 17. And it reads, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Jude chapter 1 and verse number 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy. Just look at somebody and tell them he's able. They don't believe it. Find somebody else and tell, hey, 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 I, in case you ain't heard, he's able. This, this particular passage of scripture, extracted out of the holy written word of God, deals definitively with the three Hebrew boys' origin from a Jewish descent and ancestry. It was after the Babylonian army had spread its empire from India to Ethiopia that Jerusalem, the place of peace, the, the holy city of God, had already sacked and the nation of Israel had been robbed of its best and brightest minds at this time that these three Hebrew boys who were known in their hood as Michelle, Hananiah, and Azariah were taken into bondage and slavery, and according to the Afrocentric somatic tradition of their day, 
Each child's name bore a special spiritual and divine significance such that each time that their name was mouth, it was a verbal reminder of the goodness and the grace of the almighty God. Their names were designed to mean something. Consequently, in that tradition, these three Hebrew boys were given names that bore significance in relationship to the depth of their faith, of their family, and their tradition, and their ancestral lineage. And Hananiah meant Jehovah is gracious. And, and then Michelle meant God is our resemblance. And then Azariah, Azariah meant the Lord Jehovah is my helper. Their names meant something. And, and by the way, I need to say to everybody that your name ought to mean something too. Amen. I mean, so let me ask, when people think about your name, are they irritated or inspired? Are they helped or are they harmed? Are they encouraged or are they exasperated? These, these three Hebrew boys were captured and carried from the hills of Jerusalem and taken in shackles down to the lowlands of Babylon. And they were brought there as slaves. And yet because of their combined, their strength and the things that they had, they were elevated in their positions in their captivity. Now, it was a customary part of indoctrination of the empire that whenever people were enslaved, they would change their names and thereby disconnect them from their history, from their lineage, from their heritage, and from any type of hope that they might have had. I'm gonna get the way you want the shout point in just a minute now. Now, because whether you and you, whether you, whether you know it or not, your history and your heritage and your hope, they are all connected. It, because it teaches us that if we don't know our history, we will have no sense of our heritage. And if we are unaware of our heritage, then we will ultimately have no hope. I need to say that for somebody that did not hear it. It teaches us that if we do not know our history, then we have no sense of our heritage. And if we are unaware of our heritage, then we will ultimately have no hope. You have to know where you are in order to have insight on where you are going. And, and that is why everything from your past is connected to where you are right now and, become, and can become the platform that becomes the stage that sets you up to where God is sending you to as a direct correlation of what God has already brought you through in your life. Now, be careful. Be careful how you try to cancel out where you've been because God can use where you from to set your shout and your testimony of what and where he is trying to take you to. Now, you might have been born on the wrong side of the tracks. Had a baby out of way like everybody was talking about you, you know. The hurt and, and the pain and the mistakes and the missteps, the, the infidelity, the divorce, the embarrassment, the humiliation, every failure. You have to know where you are from in order to get a grip on where you are going and where the Lord is trying to send you to. Now, be careful, be careful at how you curse out your past in the face of your present because it can bless your future. Now, now, your heritage and your history, they can help you to see clearly where you are. And, and these three Hebrew boys were given new names in the land of their captivity and came to be known as Shadrach, Meshach, and that ba a ba a Abednego. But, but though their names were changed, they remembered the meaning of the names they were given when they were back home. Now, Hananiah meant God is gracious to Shadrach meant under the command of Aku, who was a Babylonian moon god. And, and then you have Michelle, meaning that God is our resemblance to Meshach, who meant who is like Aku, the moon god. And then you got Azariah, whose name meant God is my helper, to being changed to Abednego meant servant of the gods. Now, they aren't tripping over a label or a tag. They remember who they were, and not just who they were, but whose they were. Lord, deliver me from folk who get hung up on titles. People who try to be, who, people who try to be in name, who they are not in function and reality. Now, now you can talk that talk, but if you can't walk what you talk, your title don't mean nothing. You don't have to keep announcing that you're a Christian, just be a Christian. 
You don't have to announce to everybody that you got a business, just run your business. You don't have to keep reminding everybody that you are a preacher, a pastor, a deacon, a leader. Be present. Do what it is that God has called you to do, and folk going to know who you are. Now, now, when they left the hills of Judah as captives, they were forced to leave all their possessions behind. The city was laying in ruins. Their, 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 their towers were destroyed. The, the gates of the city had been ripped from its hinges. Their money had been seized. Everything had been taken away from them. And the Babylonians were an irreligious people. They worshiped not one god, but many gods. And, and one of the unique features of Babylonian worship was that its focus changed according to who sat on the throne. Now, that, that whenever there was a new king on the throne, it meant that we now have a new God, a new order of worship, and a new practice of faith. They switched gods when they switched kings. Now, so, so when Nebuchadnezzar ascended to the throne in Babylon, he brought with him his own method and manner of religion. And the Babylonian people, accustomed to the shifting of religion, they just got into it with what he was doing. Now, but, but although these three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had lost all their possessions down in Judea, they had not lost their faith in Yahweh along the way. They, they brought that with them to Babylon, whose name meant corruption. Now, I want to let you know, you got to take your faith with you. Not just some of the way you go, but you got to take your faith with you everywhere that you go. They knew God, and they loved God, and they were determined to serve God no matter what. And although they had lost their families, they didn't lose their faith. They brought their faith with them down to Babylon. Now, they brought this with them. The Lord is my light and my salvation. They took that down there with them to Babylon. Hey, Has thou not known that the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faint not, neither is he weary. There's no searching of his understanding, for he gives power to the weak and to them that have no might. He increases their faith, for even you shall faint and be weary. Y'all, they took that with them down there to Babylon. And in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall. They took that down there with them to Babylon. Fret not yourselves because of evildoers. They took that down there with them, the Babylon. The Lord is my shepherd. They took that down there with them, the Babylon. You shall have no other God before me. They took that down there with them, the Babylon. All of their possessions and property were in Judea. But their faith still lingered in their hearts. And the laws of God were in their mind. You got to take it with you. Tell somebody to take it with you. Now, after Nebuchadnezzar had been successful in expanding the boundaries of Babylon, after his borrowed power had been used to do what he wanted to do, King Nebuchadnezzar, he wanted to celebrate himself. He wanted to celebrate his own success, to build an image, to honor himself. And according to verse number one, he bought a solid gold image. Bro, went all out. He wasn't cheap. He bought him a solid gold image on the flat of a plain in Dura in Babylon that stood 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. Everybody coming by was going to see that statue. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a success, and nothing succeeds like a success. He was a winner, and everybody loves a winner. He was a number one stunner, as we would call it, balling and shot calling, iced out and blinged out. That's what Nebuchadnezzar had going on. And this image symbolizes for us all of those false gods that arise around us that demand our attention and solicit our worship. Can I come to your seat for just a minute? What is the false god in your life? What is the false god near you that you are just that close to being tempted to bow down and worship? Is it your man? Your woman? Your boo, your child, your job, sex, drugs, whatever it is. I want to tell you very quickly that there's a false god in every one of our lives that seeks our praise and wants us to bow down to it. Bow down means to, to give in to to wither, to die, to yield, and to surrender, and to submit. And I want to tell you, you can have money, but money can't give you meaning. You can have a good job, but a good job is not going to give you joy. 
You can have a lot of good things, but those things cannot give you peace. You can have gorgeous gadgets all throughout your house, but those things are not going to turn your house into a home. You got to have Jesus up in there somewhere. No matter how it is, you, God must be present. Now, now, it takes more than stuff and possessions and all of those things, but you've got to be fully devoted, sold out, uncompromised, committed to the Almighty God. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar built a statue of himself and sent word out to everybody that he wanted them to attend his party. Now, it was, y'all got to understand, there was a RSVP event, and it was set to be off the hizzle for shizzle. It was going to be the party of the year. Now, we're talking about drinks that would be flowing. They would have an open bar up in the Elder Cross, but they would go, the music was going to be jumping, the place was going to be thumping, I mean, packed out. And sure enough, when the day came around, it was everything that it was promised to be. Everybody was up in the club, y'all. I mean, the, I mean, the brother was up in there looking clean. The women was up. I mean, everybody was packed out to celebrate the king. Now, everybody was there. The party was stopping. The music was jumping. Rihanna and Jay-Z were doing their thing under the umbrella. And Nas was standing on the stage with his one mic. And Jamie Foxx showed up and got unpredictable up in the house. And then Freddie Jackson and John Legend and Babyface and Luther just came and just rocked the house. So y'all know what I'm talking about. You ain't always been where you are. And then came the crowding moment. The king unveiled his statue and was so impressed with his own achievement that he issued a decree that when the band started playing his song, that in honor of his statue, his achievement, and his accomplishment, everybody was going to bow down and worship the golden image as the band played. This is how we do it, you know, and all that. And the music played, and everybody did what the king told them to do. Everybody but these three Hebrew boys. They, 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 messed, they, they messed it up. Word got back to the king, your majesty. Recorded in verses 8 through 12, this is a great party. This party is slamming. It's off the chain for real, for real. You are great. There's nobody like you. But when you told everybody to bow, there was these three boys back there in the back who disobeyed the decree that you gave out. And they did not bow, they did not dance, they did not do anything when your song came on. Nebuchadnezzar got mad. He got infuriated. Because in his mind, this was a day to celebrate his greatness and his honor and his achievements. It was his party and he could do what he wanted to do. He stood up in anger upon his throne in verse number 13 and said, you mean there's somebody in my party who will not bow? He said, there's somebody in here who will not bow. Tell me who they are. Are they generals? Are they aristocrats? Are they, are they men of wealth who feel that their assets exempt them from my decree? Who are they? Tell me who they are. And the messenger said, your majesty, these three men have no power. They have no political influence. They have no wealth, no royal lineage. In fact, these three men are slaves who were brought to Babylon when we bomb-rushed Jerusalem and robbed it of all its treasures. Now, the king commanded them to be seized and brought before him. And there they stood without Johnny Cochran to represent them. They had nothing but faith and nobody but God. And somebody in this house on the night knows what it's like to be standing in a rough moment in your life with nothing but a little bit of faith and a whole lot of God. I can hear the king talking now. Now, bro, word on the street is that you three boys have defied my decree. Don't you remember that it was I who promoted you from captives to courtiers? Do you not remember? I changed your name. I opened doors for you. I know you don't want to cross me. So I'm going to give you another chance. Because if you don't bow down this time, 
I'm going to put you in the burning, fiery furnace. Now, the, the, these three Hebrew boys, they huddled up in a corner, formed their own little small group elder, and, and, and they decided that before they would bow down, they would burn. You have to admire them. They faced the king, and they said, oh, king, we've talked this thing over. We put a motion on the floor, and the vote was unanimous. We ain't bound. They said, we are not careful to answer you. In other words, this don't even take a whole lot of time. It don't even take a whole lot of thought. No matter what you say and no matter what you do, we are not going to bow down to your golden image. They said, we would be obligated to you. You've elevated us from captives to quarter years. We appreciate what you've done, but we have a different perspective on the matter. For every time you open a door, we thank you, but we give God the praise. Every level that you elevated, we thank you, but we give God the praise. They say, King, we can't worship you. You were just a courier through which God sent our blessing. We can't worship you no more than we can worship a tree for giving us shade, or a cow for giving us milk, or a bee for giving us some honey. We appreciate it, but you are not worthy of our praise. God is worthy of our praise. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I praise God alone. I might love you, but I'm not going to worship you. I might respect you, but I'm not going to worship you. I might honor you, but I'm not going to worship you. King Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't bow, you're going to burn. They said, that's okay. He's still able. He's able. This is how the Spirit of God works, y'all. He will have an unbeliever to raise a question to which God is the answer. He will have an unbeliever to raise a question to which only God can be the solution. And they, they said, King, your arms are too short to box with God. They said, they said, even if he does not, we will not bow down and worship the golden image that you have set up. These three Hebrew boys had somebody here to had somebody that somebody here tonight needs. They had unconditional faith. Too many of us got conditional faith. If God does this then I'll do that. But you know what they said? It don't even matter if he doesn't. He's still able. And you've got to get to a point in your faith where you can say that even if he doesn't, if I lose my job, he's still able. If I lose my house, he's still able. If I lose my car, he's still able. If my spouse move out, you want here in the first place, he's still able. I know that God is able, and it's not a matter of if God can, but I know God will. But here it is. You got to learn how to take God at his word. If God say he's going to take care of you, Take it to the bank and cash it. God going to take care of you. If God say I provide for you, if David could say I never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread, just that David was God's child, I too am God's child. And just like he said it, I too can claim that God will take care of me. It, it's an understanding that God sometimes deals with us the way that a rat deals with the house. Now, I know ain't none of y'all got rats in your house, so this don't apply to you. <laughs> Whenever a rat gets in your house, he never digs one hole. He'll dig a hole over here, and a hole over there, and a hole over here, and a hole over here. Do you know why he dig them holes like that? That's because if a cat gets behind him, and a cat blocks one hole, he got another hole that he can go through. You follow what I'm saying? And don't you know that is what God would do for you? That when the enemy blocks one way, God got another. When the enemy blocks one way, God already got another way prepared for you. Anybody here can attest to the fact that God, has he ever made a way for anybody in here? Has he ever opened up a door that was closed in your face? Doors that have been opened, God shut them because he knew that you didn't need to go through. God always got a way of escape prepared for his children. 
We don't know how God is doing it, but we can just know that God can do it. There, were, there, there have been times in, in my life I can say, well, I didn't know how things were going to work out. All of us have stories in here where we get a test. We didn't know how things were going to fall into place, but somehow or another God made a way. Somehow or another God provided, pulled us through, and pulled us out. They, they were not phased by the king's eating. They proclaimed point blank that we will not bow down to your image. Now, if God could bring our foreparents out of slavery in Egypt and keep us, we know that he is still able. If our God could lead our people by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, we know that God is able to deliver us as well. If our God could take the wind and split the Red Sea, drive the bottom and let our foreparents walk across and find freedom from oppression and slavery, then we know that the same God is able to deliver us from what it is that we are going through right now. If you ever been sick and yet you're still standing, you are a living witness that God is. Somebody here know what it's like to be down to nothing, have a light bill due and a gas bill too. But guess what? God, you, God, make sure you got it paid. The king broke out in complete anger. He told his people, heat up the fiery furnace. Seven times hotter than normal. Because I want to make sure that nobody escapes and I want to make an example out of them. Now we know the number seven is a special number. And in biblical numerology, the number seven is a special number. There's something special about the number seven. God, God doesn't have to take you out of the situation. He can keep you in the situation and make your test a testimony for what the Lord is able to do in your life. He's there in your pain. He's there in your sickness. He's there in your despair. He's there in your disappointment, in your trial, in your affliction. God is always there. But while you're going through, you got to remember the three C's. What are the three C's? You got to remember your connection. Take, take special note of these words in verse number 17. They said, our God. These men knew that they were in a special relationship with the Father. Yeah. These men were the sons of God by faith, and that is a good relationship to be in when the fires come about in your life. Because if can't nobody else help you, we know that God is able to help us. Then number two, you got to remember who is in control. Two words used by the three, the Hebrew boys make all the difference. And those words are is and able. Uh -huh. Is and able. These words are the words of faith. These men knew that the fire was hot. Yeah. It wasn't just a normal hot. It was seven times hot. They knew that the fire was able to destroy them. They knew that there was no way for them to escape, at least from a human perspective. And as they faced the fire... They knew what it was able to do to them. However, as they faced the fire, they were also able, here it is, to faith the fire. As they faced the fire, they were also able to faith the fire. They knew that even if they were thrown into the fire, their heavenly father had the necessary power to bring them out of the fire. And let me tell you tonight, God ain't changed. He's the same today as he was yesterday. And God is still able to do that what needs to be done in your life and mine. He is still God and he is still able. Even if you are going through the fires of your life, you can rest assured that God can take care of you. In fact, if the fire comes about in your life, it had to pass through God's filter of protection before it ever came your way. Because God has already said in his word that he wouldn't put more on you than you're able to bear. So guess what? If it came your way, God designed it that way in order to build up your faith and make you the person that he would have you to be. And remember Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28 when the fire is belching about in your life and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God. Tell somebody God is in control. Then number three, you got to remember your commitment. 
Way back in Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 21, when these men were younger and they were new in Babylon, they took their stand for God and committed themselves to living for God and God alone. This is a commitment that they, they took seriously because here they were faced with their own deaths. Their lives were on the line. And still they were determined to serve the Lord. They stood in the day of testing, Brother Crosby. And, 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 and when the fire comes in your life and mine, here it is, often it will be accompanied by the temptation to throw in the towel. To not just throw in the towel, but to quit and to give up on God. However, listen, God has promised us help for the times of our testing and our trial. When you are tempted to quit, remember this. Number one, God has promised not to allow you to be tempted above your ability to bear it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13. And then during the worst trial Jesus ever faced, he didn't quit. He endured and he kept his commitment. Guess what? Because he loved you. So if you love him on the night, can, can I ask you that? Can you keep your commitment to God? Amen. And then, let me tell you, the hour of temptation and trial is when the truth of your profession is given. It is easy to vow things to God when you get saved and it look like the world is going to be perfect. However, when the tough times come, and they will, it is then that you get to honor the commitments that you made to the Lord. Commitments, may I add, that are binding and that you will have to be accountable to keep before God. Now, you need to know that when you step into the faith dimension, you become an overcomer. You, have, you can overcome not because you can do something so mighty, but because Jesus has already overcome the world. Just ask David about Goliath. Ask Noah about the awe and the flood. Ask Samson about those blinded eyes and the temple filled with Philistines. Ask Moses about the 40 years in the wilderness. Ask Joshua about the Canaan land. Ask Abraham about having to offer up his son. Ask Joseph about the pit, the prison, and the palace. Ask Mary about virgins having children. Ask Paul about a Pharisee preaching, to the, preaching the gospel. Ask a dying thief about a saving Lord. You get the picture. God is able. And maybe you're here and you know the Lord is able. But let me tell you, what God has done for us in the past is not always enough to suffice when we're going through in our present. Oh, how we so soon forget when we're going through, who brought us through? And not realizing that the same God that brought you through before, he's more than able to bring you through again. There's nothing that our God cannot do. He's able, here it is, to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ever ask or think. They say our God is able to deliver us from this burning fiery furnace. But even if he does not, he's still able. Can you imagine your faith on that level? Lord, 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 I went to the doctor and they told me they saw a couple of spots and it might be cancer and I don't know if it's going to get better, but if it doesn't, he's still able. Lord, I raised my children right, they done went wrong. They out there in the world acting like they done lost the left side of their mind. Lord, I'm praying, I'm going, Lord, I'm pleading for you to bring my children back, but Lord, even if they don't come back, you are You've got to come to a place in your life where you put your faith totally in God. Amen. I ain't talking about putting your faith in what you got in your money because guess what? Your money here today and is gone tomorrow. I, I, I'm not talking about putting your, putting your faith in a little bit of health that you got because guess what? You're feeling good right now. could be dead tonight. Here it is. Here it is. Don't put your faith in anything that is on this earth, all of these temporal things because we know that they soon will vanish and pass away, but we ought to be building our hope on things 
that are eternal. God is able, church. And I don't know, I don't know, all of us in here, everybody in here got a different story. Everybody in here got a different struggle. Everybody in here got something that it is that they're battling with. And here it is. You look at people, and we come here to church. We come on Sunday. We come on Wednesday, and, and, and we're singing, and, oh, I, I love the Lord. He heard my cry and pitied every groan. As long as I live, trouble rise. I hasten to the throne. And, and we're singing, and we're involved in the worship, and we're praying, and we're doing all this. And people looking from, from the outside in, they just thinking that you got it all together, that your home life is perfect, that your work life is perfect, that your marriage life is perfect. But here it is. They just don't know that the minute you go in the parking lot and get in your car, you got to ball your eyes crying. They don't know that when you get home, you got to pay just to have a peace of mind. They don't know that when you get on your job, you got this person working against you. You got that person working against you. But even through all of that that we got going on in our life, we got to realize that he's still able. He's not just able, he's more than able. So you can trust in him. You can lean on him. You can depend on him because he won't fail you. He'll bring you through walking through the burning, fiery furnace. Have you ever had moments in your life when you were going through whatever it was that you were going through and you felt like you were all by yourself? Who, Lord, let me call my homegirl. She ain't answering the phone. Let me call my homeboy. Bro, I didn't even pick up the phone. Went straight to voicemail. Yes, I, I, I called my mama that was only so much that she could do for me. I called daddy. That was all. But here it is. I, I learned that I had to just keep on walking through the fire. Yes. But it wasn't until I looked to the side of me okay. and recognized that I wasn't in the fire by myself. But I got somebody else that's walking alongside me. And let me tell you, whatever it is that you go through in life, you are never by yourself. God has promised never to leave you, never to forsake you. No matter where you are, God is by your side. He's watching over you. He's sheltering you. He's protecting you from danger seen and unseen. God don't just got your back. God got everything. Your front, your back, your sides, whatever. God got you. He's looking out for you. And no matter what the devil brings about your way, God, no, who? No weapon formed against you yes, sir. shall be able to prosper. That don't mean it won't form. That's a, oh, that's another 40 minutes of preaching right there. That, 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 that does not mean that the weapon will not be formed. But it will not accomplish the purpose for which it was sent out for. Anybody in here know what it's like? That when the enemy raises up or comes up against you like a flood, that the Lord said that he'll lift up a step of standing against him. The devil comes in your life just like the big bad wolf. Huffing and puffing. Blowing things down. But when he comes against somebody like us, when you got a, a foundation in Jesus Christ and, and you know the word of God and you got faith in God, the devil don't find it so easy to blow us down. But let me tell you, let me tell you, just because he didn't get you at that moment. He coming back. He coming back. And he's going to come at the moment that you think you got it all together. Oh, let any man that thinks he stands take heed unless he fall. Oh, brother, I'll never do that again. I'll never go back down that road again. I'll never be involved in that again. And man, tomorrow you're involved in the very same thing that you said you wouldn't do again. Here it is. You find out you're not as strong as you think you are. But we learn here that we are only strong in the broken places of our life. Yes. What do you mean, preacher? Because he said, when you are weak, yes. then am I. Yes. Then am I strong. Yes. In your weakness, God is able to show, God is able to come into your life and flex his muscle and let the devil know, hey, you ain't just fighting them, but you got to fight me too. And let me tell you, it ain't going to be as easy as it was with them as it is with me. Yes. Now you got a real battle on your hand. So can I tell you, stop trying to fight that stuff anyway. We all got a King Nebuchadnezzar in our life. 
We all got something that's hounding down on us and threatening us, trying to make us give in, trying to make us bow down and worship the things of this world. But when it comes, I give that stuff to God. It's in God's hand. And I let him take care of it because I know that he's able. He's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think. So can I tell you, whatever it is that you need done in your life on tonight, he's able. He's able. Struggling with sickness, can I tell you, he's able. Family life is in a mess, is in shambles. Can I tell you? He's able. Mm, it used to be everything that I loved and adored. Now I can't stand the sight of it. Can I tell you something? He's able. He's able. My, my, my Lord, my mental state ain't where I need it to be right now. I got, uh, I got so much going on right now. Lord, I don't know if, I, uh, if I'm going to go postal in a second. But Lord, let me tell you. Let me tell you. He's able. He's able. He'll give you peace that surpasses understanding. He'll give you joy that the world is not able to take away. He'll put a smile on your face after you thought you'd never be able to smile again. God will wipe away every tear from your eye. Whatever you need, he's able. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And even if he don't do it, when I want him to do it, he's still able. He's still able. And that faith kept those men in a fire. Just think about that. You, you take three of us kicking and screaming. Yeah. So it's a cough already in the hollowed out. Woo, God. You take three of us. Take me and brother and sister cough. We'll, 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 we'll be the first one. You take us and throw us in a, a fiery furnace. Lord, before we even get in there, oh, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Lord, I didn't mean to do it. Lord, no, no. But these men had such faith that they knew before they got in the fire that God was already in the fire. Can I tell you, before you ever go through, God is already in the mix of your going through. Before you ever get into the fire, God is already in the fire. God is in that. He's controlling the thermostat, not letting it get too hot to where it's going to take you out. God is able to preserve you and to keep you and protect you. From all manners of hurt, harm, and danger. He's able. Yes, sir. He's able. Oh, no matter what you done did, what you've done. No matter how dirty and messed up your life is. Can I tell you, he's able to save you. Amen. Oh, the song by this side, God, the only person I know that can take a black soul, dip it in red blood, and it come out white as snow. He's able to transform you. He's able to deliver you and keep you. And let me tell you, he won't just deliver you, but he'll give you power after you get out to be able to stand against the next time the devil comes. Here it is. So, ooh. I tell you so next time the devil come knocking on your door, you can say, now, devil, you might think you had me, but I remember the last time you came to my house and you start trying to start some trouble. God came and God brought me out and God delivered me. Now the same God that took care of you last time, he's going to take care of you this time. He's able. I don't know about you, but I'm trying. Oh, get thee behind me, saying. Oh, this sister talking power up here. She talking power up here in this car. Get thee behind me, Satan. There's power in the name of Jesus. My Bible says that the name of Jesus, demons, they flee and they tremble. We got to learn how to get back to calling on that name. And it, oh, when you wake up in the morning, who Jesus? Going throughout your day, who Jesus? Oh, in the afternoon, who Jesus? In the evening, late in the midnight hour, Jesus, when I'm going through my pillow, it's sloppy wet with tears, can't cut. Oh, Jesus. Why you call him? Because he's able. And when I cannot find another solution to my problem, 
I know that I can trust in God. I trust in Jesus totally and fully. I I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, but I know who holds tomorrow. I I, I don't know what next week holds, but can I tell you, I know who's already over in next week orchestrating the affairs of my life. That is God. Some car wreck or some something that might have hit me two weeks from now. God already went over and made sure I left my phone at the house so I had to turn around and go get my phone so I wouldn't be involved there. He's able. If you're standing in the need of the ableness of God, Grab a hold to it. Don't, don't miss out on that. I, can I tell you that the greatest thing you will ever attain in your life is faith in God. Faith in God will keep you when nothing else will keep you. Whew, every strand of hand in your head that just about fell out. And what ain't fell out used to be black, now it's white and gray. Peace. Peace, you haven't experienced it in years. Every time you get out of one test, it seems like, Lord, it seems like it's just, I'm fighting an uphill battle. Uh, get through with one thing, here comes another. Uh, got those bills out of the way, Lord, I ain't had but $20 to make it the next two weeks. Here come another bill that got to be paid by tomorrow. Lord, I don't know, I'm looking in the refrigerator. I don't, Lord, I don't see next in the, nothing in there but some hot dogs and a box of bacon soda. Lord, Lord, what am I going to do? Lord, Lord, how, how am I going to make it? He's able. God will show up. God shows up in the most unlikely places and in the most unlikely situation. Can I tell you, you know, we sing the song Lily in the Valley. When you ever seen a lily grow in a valley? (laughs) We call him the Rose of Sharon. Who ever seen a rose in a Sharon? It doesn't happen like that. But the reason the songwriters put it like that was to let you know that you will find God in the most unlikely places. You will find God in the most unlikely situation. And I'm sure some of y'all got your own stories in here where you can say, man, God showed up. God showed out. I didn't know how it was going to happen. I didn't know how it was going to pull through. But somehow or another, God pulled between a rock and a hard place. God pulled away out of no way. And here I am standing on the night with my mouth open and my hands lifted up, blessing and giving God's name to pray for what he has already done in my life. So whatever it is that you're standing in the need of on the night, I want to let you know that he's able. Whatever you need, God got it. And he's just waiting to give it to you. He's just waiting. First, be a person to say, Father, I stretch my hands unto thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, where the Lord shall I go? You don't know, you feel like you're just walking in darkness. Lord, where's the light? I want to let you know he's able to shine light in the most darkest of situations. He's able, church. He's able to bring you through, to bring you over. When man said no, he says yes. When man puts a period, God puts a comma. God can always do more than what you are able to see or comprehend. But you got to, first of all, put your faith in him. Trust God for your life. Trust God for your everything. Give God your everything. Surrender your life to him. If you have not yet surrendered your life to him, why not surrender yourself? All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely I freely give, Lord, and, and he didn't say I'm freely giving it. Lord, I'm not giving myself expecting you to do something. I'm giving myself knowing that you're going to do something. But that's not the reason that I'm doing it. I'm doing it because, Lord, if I don't give myself to you, who am I going to give myself to? Amen. Who going to rock me when I get weary? Who going to dry my tears when I can't stop crying? Who's going to keep me in perfect peace and keep my mind stayed in here? God can do it. He can do that, and he can do so much more. So by chance you're here on tonight, 
and you're standing in need of the ableness of God for whatever it is. If you're standing in the need of prayer, come. We want to pray with you. Oh, Lord, all of us got us. Oh, everybody in here needs some prayer. Pray for me. Huh? You know, oh, Lord, some days is, you know, better than other days. Oh, keep me in your prayer. Lord, somebody needs you for one thing. Somebody needs you for another. But, ooh, we all standing in the need of prayer. So if you're here tonight, you're standing in the need of the ableness of God for whatever situation it is you have going on in your life. And you need prayer. We'll be glad to pray with you. If you're here tonight and you are not yet a Christian, you are definitely in need of the ableness of God. You are, you are in the need. And here it is. This, this, and here it is. The gospel was made just for you. What do you mean, preacher? It is able to draw your sin-sick soul out of a sin-cursed world, bring you in and wash you up and clean you up. And set you out on your new journey living for Jesus Christ. So if you're here, if you're here on tonight and you're not a Christian, you know, oh, this invitation is especially for you. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have anything. Three and four commas in your bank account, that's good. Why me a little something? But guess what? You ain't. <laughs> you can have all of that. House on a hill, boat on the lake. Breakfast in the morning with a big juicy steak. But guess what? If you ain't got Jesus, you ain't got nothing. I got Jesus. I don't know about y'all. I, I got him all in my pinky toe. Yeah, everything. He, he just all over me. I can't make it without him. I wouldn't dare try and go without him. I need the Lord to walk with me. I need him. I need him. If you're here tonight, you're subject to the invitation. You're not a Christian. You come to Jesus by hearing this word. Believe it with all of your heart. Be willing to repent of your sins. Confess Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Give your life to him by going down in the water and grave of baptism. Have your sins washed away, eradicated, done away with, never to come up before you in this life, neither the life that is to come. And the Lord himself will add you to his body. And at that moment, you'll receive a brand new birth certificate. Your life starts anew. Your life starts afresh. You are now a son of the Most High God, an heir to the promise of God. And let me tell you, if you live right, you'll get to go to heaven one day. So my brother, my sister... If you're here tonight, you're subject to the invitation. Don't put off today for what you plan on doing tomorrow. Wow, the blood on this Wednesday night. Y'all, we lit on a Wednesday night. The saints, the saints are going, hashtag, the saints going in on a Wednesday. Y'all caught that? Saints going in on a Wednesday. So, so if you're here tonight, you're subject to the invitation. You need to come on to my Jesus. As together we stand and sing the song of invitation. Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus. How I love to call on your name, Jesus, Ooh, Jesus. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good day. Every day, your name is the same, Jesus.
So anytime we get to help him and Amen. some opportunity to, to support him and Lord knows he can preach the gospel. Yes, Amen. Yes, sir. Him, Amen. Uh, his success and all his endeavors. But we're going to ask you to open up your hearts and your purse and wallets. Amen. And support Brother Travante. We're going to send the brothers out now. Lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and the little light from heaven filled my soul. And you know that it made my heart and love. My Lord and wrote my name up. Well, now just a little talk with Jesus. Oh, now, now let us have a talk with Oh, and let us tell them all about. Just recording, recording, getting better, a little better, a little better sound and better. 